When I was 12 years old, I drove my bike down to the Detroit River with my friends and fished along the banks of this most polluted river in North America. And I was appalled at how much oil and grease was floating on the Detroit River. All the rocks along the shoreline uh, were coated with oil and grease. I couldn't understand how we, as a society, could do that to the Detroit River. I couldn't believe that we were polluting the river like we were. And uh, I had a family that was uh, very passionate about making a difference. My parents taught me to be a steward and to be a good steward. And I developed that interest first through school, taking courses in biology and chemistry, going on through uh, university and developed my interest. After having this awakening of how polluted the river was, I wanted to go on and study and learn how to make a difference, learn what could be done and devote myself to making a difference and cleaning up the Detroit River. In university, I developed a specialty in aquatic sciences, in the field of limnology, which is the ecological study of fresh water. I went on to study at the University of Michigan and work and do environmental impact statements on power plants on the Great Lakes. From there, I went to work for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources on doing environmental assessments of the Great Lakes to determine its quality. I went on to work at the International Joint Commission, a, an organization set up by treaty between Canada and the United States for protection of the Great Lakes. From there, I was appointed as river navigator for the Greater Detroit American Heritage River Initiative, and we developed the idea of an international wildlife refuge. Both countries came together and said, we cannot do it individually, we have to do it together. And uh, passed legislation like the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Canada-US Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. We've seen a 90% decline in phosphorus loadings to the river since I was a 12-year-old boy fishing in this polluted river. We've seen uh, reductions in chloride loadings to the river. We've seen a cleanup, $154 million of contaminated sediment cleanup in the river. We've seen reductions in mercury in fish, a 70% decline of mercury contamination in fish. We still have health advisories on certain species and certain size classes, but we've seen improvement. We've seen improvement in DDT and PCB contamination in herring gull, herring gull eggs. That is an, a remarkable environmental improvement of the Detroit River. But that is not the most important part of the story. The most important part of the story is that the response we've seen in what lives in and along the river. We had no bald eagles reproducing along the Detroit River for over 25 years. Now we have them nesting and producing young in seven locations. We had no peregrine falcons producing young because of organochlorine contamination. And now we have them uh, reproducing at many locations uh, along these skyscrapers in downtown Detroit and on the Ambassador Bridge. We have uh, osprey nesting for the first time since 1890s along the river. We have a return of lake sturgeon, lake whitefish, for the first time in over 30 years and reproducing successfully in the river. We have now a walleye population from when I was a kid, 12 years old, in a crisis state to a world-class fishery and part of the walleye capital of the world. If you add all that up, it is the single most remarkable ecological recovery story in North America, which led me to today, which is uh, being the manager of the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge. I'd like to see each of you college and university students get involved on your campus. Propose some green programs for your campus. Get involved in native wildflower gardens. Get involved in putting a green roof on one of your buildings. Get involved in an urban garden. Get involved in making a difference and learn how to be a sustainable campus. Where all of this will start is on campuses. You have a huge opportunity 
uh, to learn and to teach others how to do it. We're standing here at the lower Detroit River uh, on a former uh, industrial site, now an automotive manufacturing site, uh, uh, where Chrysler Corporation produced brakes and paints. Um, they left the site, cleaned it up to industrial standards, and walked away. It said abandoned for 15 years. Uh, we then acquired it as the gateway to the International Wildlife Refuge. We have spent the last year cleaning it up, restoring habitats. This is important because we're standing right now looking at the Lower Detroit River, an archipelago of islands and marshes. It's part of a conservation crescent that spans the lower end of Grosseau, an island, um, and stretches all the way from Canada to the United States. Over my shoulder sits the lower end of Grosseau, uh, Calf Island, Celeron Island, the open waters of Western Lake Erie, Point Mouille State Game Area, Humbug Island, and Humbug Marsh. This is why birds and fish are so, this is so important for them. Um, over 300 species of birds migrate through this migration corridor. There are 113 species of fish that use this river and its habitats. Um, that's what makes us so unique. We are on a biodiversity investment area. We are an important area in the North American waterfowl management plan. We are an international wildlife refuge. Uh, in front of me sits a power plant, the Trenton Channel Power Plant. And off to my left is a chemical plant owned by Seleucia. What a wonderful statement that we can have an international wildlife refuge in harmony with industry. I think that's one of the unique things about what we're doing is here, is working in partnership, public-private partnerships, to restore habitats, to protect and preserve and conserve an international wildlife refuge. This also, then, enhances our quality of life, um, helps attract and retain uh, employees for our businesses, and makes it uh, a place where people want to come and recreate. You don't have to travel four and five hours up north to get a phenomenal fishing experience, a phenomenal kayaking experience. You don't have to go up north to hunt. You can do it all right here in your backyard of southeast Michigan and part of the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge. Standing in front of me here are the stacks for the Trenton Channel Power Plant. Think of it. We are, have an international wildlife refuge in the heart of the Industrial Revolution. If you go across, you see the open waters of the Trenton Channel of the Detroit River, the island of Grosseau, Calf Island, Celeron Island, the open waters of Western Lake Erie, the dikes of Point Mouille State Game Area, Humbug Island, Humbug Marsh, and the uplands of Humbug. An incredible scene perspective on the conservation crescent that surrounds the lower Detroit River that spans from Canada all the way over to the United States. Fifteen years ago, a group of citizens came together and there was a proposal to develop Humbug Island, Marsh, and the Uplands for another subdivision. They were going to put in housing. They were going to put an 18-hole golf course a riding stables. They were going to build a bridge to the island and put McMansions on it. They were going to put a riding stables in there. It was going to look like every other suburb in southeast Michigan. A group of citizens came together and they had to have a public hearing to um, develop these wetlands. So many people came to that public hearing at Gibraltar Carlson High School that they had to shut the doors. The fire marshal would allow no more people to come in that building. The state police had to close the, the exit off of I-75 and tell people, if you're going to the public hearing, do not come. There is no room. 
99.99% of those people spoke out and said, how can we develop the last mile of natural shoreline on the U.S. mainland of the Detroit River? Out of that came an effort to conserve and preserve Humbug Island and Marsh. It became the keystone property of the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge. We went on with scientists, with students from universities, and scientists from, from universities in both Canada and the United States to put the rationale together to become a wetland of international importance under the International Ramsar Convention. There are 1,900 of such sites throughout the world, 29 in the United States, and only one in Michigan. It is a Ramsar wetland of international importance, and it is Humbug Island and Marsh. We got that designation several years ago. Now we have students from high schools and universities coming in here every month to study this area, to help us understand it, to help restore habitats. It is a great opportunity for students, both high school students and universities, to come in here and to be part of this incredible transformation of an industrial brownfield into an ecological buffer for a wetland of international importance. Nowhere in the world are we restoring a brownfield, expanding the ecological buffer for a Ramsar site, and making it an um, important part of a major urban area. That is called Humbug Island and Marsh. A brownfield is a former industrial manufacturing site. They manufactured brakes and paints and other solvents out on this site for 44 years. They walked away from it. They cleaned it up to industrial standards. That means we could put another industry here, but we couldn't have it clean enough for um, human health and wildlife standards. We have been working for the last year eight years to clean it up, to restore habitats, to make it so it can be the gateway to the International Wildlife Refuge. We will be building our visitor center on this site. Kids every day of the school year will be coming here to use the river, to use Lake Erie as a living laboratory. They will go out on the Michigan Sea Grant school ship and learn every day. We have a kayak landing here. We have trees in the middle of of humbug that are over five and a half feet in diameter. Old oaks that were alive when Cadillac founded Detroit. They will be able to come here and learn about old growth forest in an urban area, about wetlands, about island habitats, about shrub scrub habitats, about uplands, and how are we are we are storing them and protecting them for future generations. They will be part of understanding it from a scientific perspective and then actually doing work to be good stewards of this property. It is an amazing story of how many people come together to make something happen in a major urban area.